Hello, I'm Larry Wilson. Welcome to the June 2005 broadcast. Today I'm going to give you a final reminder that our subscription renewal is now open for the next six months. That is July through December 2005. I hope you will subscribe and even more. I hope you will share your DVDs and tapes with your friends. Subscription renewals must be received by June 10 to receive the following prices. Let's put it on the computer screen for you. A subscription for six months, DVD, $20, audio CDs, $15, and audio tapes, $12. That's for six months. So please take advantage of the low price and the subscription renewal and don't Procrastinate. June 10, the deadline for these prices is not far away. You can give us a call at 1-800-475-0876. So, I hope you will make every effort to subscribe and renew your prescription <laughs> because you need a healthy dose of Bible study. And... Uh, we're going to continue today with our investigation into Revelation chapter 3 and specifically the churches of Philadelphia and Laodicea. Now in our last uh, seminar, in our last segment, I was not able to complete um, our study on Philadelphia, so I'm going to do just a short review and we will then proceed and go forward. Let's begin by reading Revelation 3 verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These are the words of him who is holy and true. What the word holy means is set apart. God is holy. He is set apart from all creation. He is not one of us. He is above us. And that's what makes him holy. And Jesus says he is true. That means he speaks nothing but the whole truth. And the Bible says he holds the key of David. This is a um, language indicating that Jesus has all authority. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. This uh, phraseology is taken from Isaiah 22, verses 21 and 22, and you can see parallel language in that reference. And what it really means is that Jesus has all authority and it's beyond dispute. For what he shuts, no one can open, and what he opens, no one can shut. Revelation 3, verse 8. Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut because I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Verse 9, I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you instead of them. You notice the little words in brackets are my own words that I am inserting to make the flow of the idea uh, complete. Revelation 3.10 Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the Greek word here, treio, is translated in most versions of the Bible. I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I think treio should be translated, I will also preserve you through the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who live upon the earth. I'll say more about that later on, 
But I just mentioned this in passing because many people use this verse as support for the idea of a pre-tribulation rapture, and I don't think that's an accurate or fair or representative treatment of this verse at all. And I'll show you why later on. Verse 11, Jesus says to the church at Philadelphia, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Revelation 3, verse 12. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I will also write on him my new name. Notice how Jesus refers to the Father. I will write on him the name of my God. Now this is Jesus speaking. So overcomers are going to have the name of the Father written on them. They're going to have the name of the city written on them, showing their residence, their home of residence, the new Jerusalem. And they're also going to have uh, the new name that Jesus is going to be using throughout eternity. This name is mentioned in Revelation 19 as a, no, as a name which no one yet knows except Jesus. Verse 13, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, we've now completed the message to the church at Philadelphia, and we want to look at some of the specifications of their problems and of the promises that Jesus made to these people. The church at Philadelphia, like the church at Smyrna, was suffering persecution from the Romans. Christianity was an illegal religion, you may recall, in AD 95. In addition to this grievous problem of persecution, the church at Philadelphia was embroiled in a bitter conflict between Jewish converts and Gentile converts. This conflict is called the synagogue of Satan. Conflict. Remember that name, the synagogue of Satan. Conflict. And this controversy also affected the church at Smyrna. In a nutshell, Jewish converts to Christianity insisted that Gentile converts must be circumcised, observe the feast days and other Levitical laws if they were going to be the children of Abraham and heirs of the promises given to Abraham. That's what the controversy is all about. Jewish converts versus Gentile converts. And you must remember this is AD 95 and Christianity was struggling with its Jewish roots and baggage. Jewish converts coming into Christianity brought a lot of their religious baggage with them. And one of the reasons that God had scattered the Christians from Jerusalem, you know, when it was destroyed in AD 70, was to prevent Christianity from becoming Jewish. This is why Jesus said, watch carefully now, I will make those, here to the church of Philadelphia, the Lord says, I will make those who boast about their Jewish heritage, but are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet, and acknowledge that I have loved you instead of them. Wow! <laughs> as far as the king of the Jews is concerned, calling yourself a Jew does not make you a Jew. That really is the heart of this controversy. Let me explain. God hates self-righteousness and self-importance. 
I need to be perfectly clear on this subject because self-righteousness and self-importance is a common human characteristic. It is a powerful component in our selfish, fallen nature. You know, me first, me, me best, me most. <laughs> Some people have a capacity for more self-righteousness and self-importance than others. Perhaps you've noticed that too. They are full of it. <laughs> Self-righteousness and self-importance is that part of the curse of sin that God hates most because a self-righteous sinner magnifies his self-importance to the place that ultimately he takes the place of God. A self-important and self-righteous person likes to give orders. He likes to be the boss. He likes to be up front. He likes to be out front. He seeks and wants attention and adulation. As a matter of fact, a pompous, self-righteous sinner is a perfect reflection of Lucifer. The devil became so pompous and right in his own thinking that God became inferior. Do I need to repeat that? The devil became so pompous and right in his own thinking that God became inferior. Here's the bad news. Self-righteousness is an inseparable component of religion because selfishness is the core of our carnal hearts. Every person and every religion on earth has a problem with self-righteousness because it is the core of our carnal heart. Let me prove to you that religion suffers from this dilemma. No religion on earth, no church group on earth will admit that another religion knows more about God than itself. Me first, me best, me most. <laughs> you see what religion basically is just an extension of the carnal heart. Unfortunately that's the case. Self-righteousness is an attitude of superiority. I know most, I know best, and I'm better off than the others. And get this, and the clergy, those who preach or teach, in other words, religious leaders, are cursed with a double portion of self-righteousness. I know this from personal experience. <laughs> Here's why. It is a contradiction in terms for a person to be a seeker of truth and at the same time a defender of the faith. It's a contradiction in terms. How can you be both a seeker of truth and a defender of the faith? On the other hand, it is possible for a person to have the humility of a child. Luke 18, 17, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. In the King James Version, it goes, verily, verily, I say unto you. Whenever you read those words, or in the New International Version, when you read the words Jesus saying, I tell you the truth, you know a profound statement is coming. Pay close attention. Jesus is saying something profound. When you see those words, verily, verily, I say unto you, or I tell you the truth, Jesus goes on, verse 17, Anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Wow. God doesn't ask us to convert other people to our way of thinking. God doesn't want us shoving our religious beliefs down the throats of other people. 
Rather, God only asks that we be able to share and explain to others the joy and the reasons for the hope that is within our hearts. 1 Peter 3.15 says, Peter writes, And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this, Peter says, with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. When Jesus was on earth, the leaders of Israel could not understand his teachings because of their self-righteousness. They knew from the start they were right, and Jesus was wrong. This is how self-righteousness works. If Jesus were on earth today, most, if not all, religious leaders would not give him five minutes of serious consideration because of self-righteousness. Here's a little test. See if you can understand what I'm, what I'm trying to say here. What would be the likelihood of a Jehovah's Witness searching for truth by reading a book produced by a Catholic priest? <laughs> you would say zero. That's not going to ever happen because you know and I know Jehovah's Witnesses are not permitted to read religious materials produced by other religious bodies. But they ask everyone else to read their materials. It's interesting, isn't it, how that works. You see, the Jehovah's Witnesses are so firmly convinced that they have and know God's truth they are persuaded there is no point in reading other literature. I would also like to use this behavior of the Jehovah's Witnesses to demonstrate a second point. Even if your own church does not prohibit you from reading doctrinal materials produced by other churches, you probably don't. Why? Self-righteousness? Or is it laziness? <laughs> you see, when a particular view on a doctrine makes sense, most people stop their investigation, and this is a problem because truth itself never stops unfolding. So what makes sense today may not make sense when more light on a particular subject is exposed. This is why we have to ma maintain a childlike attitude, that of a student. A self-righteous person thinks that he has surrounded the truth on a particular matter, and then he shuts his mind. This is what self-rightness is all about. I'm right. I know the truth, and I don't want to hear anything different. <laughs> Have you heard those kinds of words before? Well, if you haven't, just go to church next week and take a new idea and see how long they ask it is before they ask you to leave. <laughs> you see, churches, by nature, circle the wagons after they have determined what is a body of faith or truth that they're going to embrace, and they shut out anything further. They don't want to hear it. It's divisive. It causes problems. It causes division. And the church is all about harmony and unity and being together in one boat that is going down. <laughs> That's what self-rightness does. Let's get back to the computer screen before I get to preaching instead of teaching here. I must confess that if Jesus were on earth today masquerading as an ordinary carpenter, 
I would probably ignore his teachings until I saw a miracle. That's just the way we are. That's the way humanity is. And be honest, wouldn't you do the same? Most of us would. Most of us would. In my case, it's probably more dangerous than your case because, you see, I have spent the last 30 years digging myself into the hole that I am now, and um, getting out of it would, be, would, would mean ditching everything I've learned. And only if I saw some powerful miracle and listened carefully to the words and character of Jesus and the Holy Spirit as he spoke, would I be able to climb out of the hole that I've dug in my own understanding? I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. And because Jesus identified himself to the church at Philadelphia with a description that's very important because it takes this description to overcome self-righteousness. Jesus said, these are the words of him who is holy and true. He can say that because he is the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus is speaking as God to the church at Philadelphia, and he was speaking the truth. And his comments to the Jewish converts in Philadelphia and Smyrna, remember the two churches having the problem with the synagogue of Satan conflict, his comments to both churches are brutal. Jewish converts in the church at Philadelphia claimed to be superior to their Gentile brothers because they were ancestors of Abraham. But Jesus condemned the Jews twice by saying, A, that they were of the synagogue of Satan. In other words, the attitude they had toward their fellow believers put them not in the church of Christ, but the synagogue of Satan. And then second, Jesus comes right out and says, you're all liars. You say you're Jews, but you're not Jews. Jesus used some very strong words. What were the Jewish converts lying about? They said they were Jews and were not. Now, if you have spiritual ears to hear, Listen carefully to this. Jesus said, I will make those who are the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not but liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you instead of them. This message in the, to the church at Philadelphia should cause every Christian to examine his spiritual condition. Listen carefully to this. The word Jew means something different to God than it does to man. Let me say that again. I rarely say anything profound. <laughs> the word Jew means something different to God than it does to man. To God, the term Jew refers to those who, like Abraham, chose to serve God with a pure heart, with a heart of a servant. Jesus is the king of the Jews, not the race, but the people like Abraham, who chose and choose to serve God with a heart of a servant. Jesus is the king of the Jews because he chose to do the will of the Father with a pure heart, the heart of a servant. For this reason, the Father has exalted his Son as the King of those having servant hearts. To mankind, the term Jew identifies a race of people. But there is a world of difference between God's use of the word Jew and man's use of the word Jew. The descendants of Abraham were first called Jews in the book of Esther around the 5th century BC. For almost a thousand years before the Babylonian captivity, 
the descendants of Abraham were called Hebrews, which is an Aramaic word which simply means gypsy. The Hebrews were gypsies. And if you'll go to Genesis 14, 13, you'll see that Abraham was called a gypsy, a Hebrew, not a Jew. During the Babylonian captivity, the Babylonians created a denigrating word for the self-righteous captives from Judea. The Hebrews let the Babylonians know in, a, in no uncertain terms that they were God's chosen people. And this claim amused the Babylonians because these gypsies were nothing but exiles and slaves. So instead of calling them gypsies, the Babylonians used the slang Jew, J-U, to represent the self-asserting chosen race from Judea. And so the term Jew originated from Judea, the location where the gypsies came from. History says this is how the term Jew came to be. You might be surprised to know that this derision and scorn that the Babylonians had for the Jews comes as a fulfillment to prophecy. Jeremiah 29:18. God told Jeremiah about Israel who had been unfaithful. He says, I will pursue them, that is Israel, my people, with a sword, famine, and plague, and I will make them abhorrent to all the kingdoms of the earth, and an object of cursing and horror of scorn and reproach among all the nations where I drive them. Why? Verse 19. For they have not listened to my words, declares the Lord, words that I sent to them again and again by my servants, the prophets. And you exiles in Babylon have not listened either, declares the Lord. Well, we're out of time for this segment, but we're going to continue with our examination of the great difference between what God considers a Jew and what man calls a Jew and how this fits into the controversy at the church at Philadelphia. Well, may God bless you, and we'll see you in our next seminar segment.